Welcome everyone to the webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Today we're going to talk all about proof testing and especially the effectiveness of proof tests, um, really looking at final elements. My name is Lauren. I work here at Exeter. I work primarily with our mechanical customers. I work doing FMEDAs and on-site um, evaluations, helping our customers get up um, and be able to have a certified product. I also um, teach our FSE courses. I like to say that no matter where we are or your customers are or your suppliers are, we have someone close by to you that helps with functional safety, whether it's in um, functional safety itself or alarm management or cybersecurity, we have someone close by to help. Exida is involved with the complete supply chain, and so you can really break us up into four main sectors. We have our OEM side, um, system designer, end user, and engineering contractor. So no matter what part of the um, supply chain lifecycle you're in, we have um, tools and classes, webinars, books, and consulting to help you reach achieve your functional safety needs. As I said, both in our engineering and our consulting services, we have um, people that specialize in cybersecurity, alarm management, process safety, and functional safety. Along with our people, we have our tools, and our tools are all designed to really help you save time and save money, and we do that we, by increasing your efficiency and your productivity. So whether you're doing PHAs, LOPAs, SIL selection or verification, if you're trying to create your SRS or proof test procedures, doing um, site safety index assessments, um, cyber risk assessment, alarm rationalization, we have um, tools to help with any of these portions of the functional safety life cycles. Along with our tools and our people, we have certification. And if you're buying certified products, this is the products that you will be buying. This is what your, um, the manufacturers of those devices have been through. Um, probably an IEC 61508 certification. And this goes through the standards and making sure that no matter who is getting certified, they meet all of the requirements of the standards that apply to their device. So today's webinar is going to be talking about proof testing and how it's a very important part of the management of all of the functional safety and especially your safety instrumented functions and your safety instrumented system. As this is an activity that's required by some of the functional safety standards such as IEC 61508 and 511, more and more end users are saying this is something we want to do. They're doing the best that they can do but it's there's a lot of confusion still on what needs to be included in the test, what coverage should be claimed when they include the certain things in that test. So today we're going to look at um, a couple techniques to determine the functionality to the test as well as what that functionality coverage would be. So we're going to look um, and map different failure modes from the components to the devices to the element to illustrate how accurate proof test coverage values can be determined and um, what the process is to do that is. But before we get into um, the details of proof test coverage and proof testing, um, we're going to take a step back and just 
um, to find what safety culture is. And without a proper safety culture at a site, no matter if how great of products you buy, whether they're certified or not certified, it really doesn't matter. Um, the way safety culture plays a part, um, you could have the best device in the world, but if you never do testing of it, you don't do um, maintenance on time or maintenance correctly. If you think you've done it correctly, there's also, if you have humans doing the worst, there's or work, there's a chance that um, it isn't done correctly. What if someone has a bad day and does an imperfect repair or they miscalibrate something? So all of these have to play um, factors into the safety culture and the safety culture can actually increase or decrease the functional safety performance of each device. The Site Safety Index, or SSI, you might hear me refer to it as, is actually a model um, that simplified an approach based on concepts from IEC 61508 and IEC 61511. And it more accurately accounts for site-specific operational practices. Um, Right now, you might be thinking, well, why are you calling it site-specific operational pra practices or site safety index instead of company or just leaving off everything together and saying just the safety index? Well, um, originally, it was looking at from company to company and seeing how different companies are um, doing their maintenance capabilities and um, doing the um, safety performance. But looking at the studies and all of the documentation cases closer, it's actually the same company but site to site can have different safety cultures. Um, even if there's the same corporate policy, different sites may interpret that differently. And that actually has an effect on the level of performance from the exact same device. And when you're comparing this to the FAMIDA or the F failure modes effects and diagnostic analysis um, that produces the failure rates, one site, even at the same company, might be doing very well and surpassing the FMEDA. They're not having failures very often or doing what is expected where their sister company might not have the same safety culture. They might not do maintenance on time or always perform correctly. And they are coming up with failures more often than predicted. So the site safety index allows those companies that have a strong safety process take credit for those accomplishments while not masking issues at other sites. The site safety index model um, is broken down into five major categories from zero to four and they kind of correlate along with the SIL rating. So SIL zero meaning none to SIL four is the hardest. And it indicates the level of site activities and practices that contribute to the safety performance of that SIF on that site. Um, as you can see, um, Site safety index zero um, comes up as none. There are no repairs done. Um, testing is not done. The equipment just keeps going until it is completely stops working. There's never um, a replacement done after the end of useful life. To a still site safety index level of two, which is typical, where repairs are mostly done correctly, and testing is mostly done correctly and on schedule, and equipment is 
most of it is replaced before the use end of useful life. Um, that's where we find most people tend to be a site safety index of two. The whole way up to um, the site safety index of four where everything's perfect, always done correctly, always on time, always replaced ahead of schedule. Um, this site safety index of four implies that every single requirement of IEC 61508 and IEC 61511 are met at the site and therefore there's no degradation of the safety performance. There's nothing that could happen um, due to any end user activities or practices or maintenance or anything that they can control and that the product is inherent safety performance is actually being achieved. Um, one of the largest things that site safety index affects is actually the probability of failure on demand. That is because the probability of failure on demand is one of the three design barriers to actually achieving your safety integrity level. So there are three design barriers or three hurdles that you have to jump to actually be ach um, achieving a certain SIL level that the standard demands. So it demands that you have your systematic capability. That is where if you're buying um, certified products, that's what's on the certificate. You have your um, the SIL based on the probability of failure on demand, the average if it's a low demand or PFH for high demand, and Route 1H or Route 2H is the architectural constraints, Route 1H being your safe failure fraction and Route 2H being more proven in use application. So the one we're really going to look at today is how um, the average probability on failure of failure on demand is affected by safety culture and proof testing. There are nine key variables in the um, equation for the average probability of failure on demand. And each of these is very important, but one of the most important is actually the proof test effectiveness. And that's going to be um, the proof test method and how affected that method and procedures are. This is one of the most effective variables and we're really going to dig down deeper into that today. But if you want more information on the other eight variables in the probability of failure on demand calculations, um, we have webinars just on that topic. Um, but today we're going to really look into proof test effectiveness. So to really understand what is important in an effective proof test, you have to really understand what a proof test is. And the testing is a really important part of that functional safety life cycle and how you manage your safety instrumented functions and your safety instrumented system. Um, as this activity is required by functional safety standards such as IEC 61508 and 511, um, more people are saying we need to include this. We want to be following all of these functional safety standards and we're saying our plant is this safe. It's um, something that we need to be following. So there is some type of confusion brought on on what needs to be covered. The standard itself says that a manual periodic test performed to detect dangerous hidden failures in a safety related system so that if necessary a repair can be done to restore the system to an as new condition or as close as practical to this condition. That still left some confusion. So Exeter took it a step further and we said that a proof test is that and the purpose of this proof test is to detect any failures not detected by automatic online diagnostics. 
So your online diagnostics, so these would be dangerous failures, diagnostic failures, parametric failures, and to detect any authorized program changes. So a main objective of a proof test is to detect any failures not detected by automatic online diagnostics. So when you're designing a proof test, what do you need to be considering? Well, there's two major um, requirements in a proof test design. You need to figure out what it needs to do functionally, what that SIF needs to do. Does it need to close on trip or open on trip? Along with any performance requirements. Um, is there a leakage allowable or is it tight shut off? Is there timing that needs to happen? Um, is there any exceptions in the safety manual that you need to consider when you're doing the requirements. For example, you might have a um, SIF that has a final element that must close to um, class 3 leakage within 180 seconds. So that lets you know that it's a close on trip application, this type of leakage with this timing requirements. And this is just a simplified um, approach and an example, but this gives you, um, you need to not only think about the functional requirements, but also the performance requirements when you are designing your proof test. So what does a proof test look like? Well, if you're doing a proof test, and of course the perfect proof test, um, you know that there's, if you just do the test, there's no need to repair. You know it's, it's working, it's good. So when you take a look at failures, as time goes on, the probability of a failure happening increases. So as time wears on, you increase the chance of a failure happening until you decide, oh, I'm going to do a proof test. At that point, you know that everything's in working condition the chances of a failure happening are zero because you just tested it. It's great. You did a perfect proof test and you're good to go. So then you start the process over. However many um, proof tests are within your mission time of the device. So what is the probability of failure if we know that there's no failure? Well, it's zero. But what if there is the probability or that demand occurs in the middle? You don't know exactly when that demand is going to occur, so the standard allows you to take an average of the probability of failure if it is a long time period. So if that demand is occurring infrequently, say once a year, you can then average, because you don't know if the failure would occur a demand on the system at this point, or at this point, or at this point. So you're going to have to take the average of the probability, and that in return represents the average probability of failure on demand. That's the calculation that the standard provides for you. So I keep on saying the perfect proof test or the ideal proof test, and it goes back down to zero. Well, everything's, why is the perfect proof test not perfect? Well, for example, what if you run a functional test and see that the system responds? Then everything works, right? It seems perfect. Was there anything missed? Was there everything tested? Um, what if you have a pressure sensor and it's isolated and the pump up such that the sensor exceeds that trip point? The remote actuated valve, you take a look at it, you see that it moves. Did you test everything that that SIF needs to do? Well, you didn't fully close it, so the valve seat might not seal properly. Well, the response time wasn't measured. How do you know if you didn't exceed that time that you were given. The process connections maybe of the sensors maybe fell. You didn't check if there was power supply droop or wire resistance or um, 
current disabling diagnostics alarm. So there's many things that weren't tested in this example of simply having your pressure sensor isolated, pump up the sensor so it seeds the trip point, the valve moves. So what does that look like on our graph? So originally, as time increased, as time increased, the probability of failures were increasing. And then at that such point, you dropped down to zero with a 100% proof test or that perfect proof test. But we now know that it won't necessarily be proof test. So that's where your effectiveness comes into play. So now you have your proof test effectiveness being a percentage of that actual um, how effective was it from 0 to 100. Say you are 70% effective, this line will then go, instead of going down to absolutely 0, it will stop about the 70% and then start over again. And this is going to continue however many test periods are in your mission time or that operational lifetime of the plant or device. So this isn't too big of a deal, it's just a little different. Well, that might be so for the first or the second time, but what if you are having five or 10 mission times in one, um, or test periods in one mission time? Well, here, originally, we calculated the probability of failure on demand to be a cell three. However, after the second, the third test period, you now have fallen to a PFD average of a SIL2 instead. And then it continues to worsen. So as I said, this might not have a very dramatic effect on you if it's just two test periods per mission time, but after five or 10, you might actually dropping yourself an entire safety integrity level or more where it becomes a dangerous time is where your calculations show that you needed a SIL-3 SIF when you're actually only running a SIL-2 SIF. You might have think that you're um, safe when you're really not. So let's look at this as an example. So say you have a high level protection SIF and you designed a single, you have a single SIL-3 certified level transmitter, a SIL-3 certified logic solver, a single remote actuated valve having a solenoid, a certified solenoid valve, a certified scotch yoke actuator, and a certified ball valve. I went and I created this in Excellentia and um, chose the following um, parameters and assuming with 100% proof test coverage. When we put this in Excellentia, there's a couple things to note here that the average probability of failure on demand for the entire SIF is 6.82 times 10 to the negative 3. And that is saying that you are at a SIL 2. Um, that's broken apart into your sensors being 5.55 times 10 to the negative 4, your logic solver 9.55 10 to the negative 6, and your final element 6.26 10 to the negative 3. We're going to keep everything mostly the same. Um, except for the proof test coverage, you're going to have a 90% proof test coverage for your sensor, and you're going to have a 70% proof test coverage for your final elements. And this time, we're going to do the proof test online, and during your proof test, it takes two hours online to do. So now, we run the um, Excellentia example, and you can see 
you are now at a PFD average of 5.76 10 to the negative 2. That's broken down into 2.77 10 to the negative 3, 1.14 10 to the negative 5, and what really dropped your final elements at 5.49 10 to the negative 2. Well, what does that really mean of a difference? Well, you then drop from a SIL 2 to a SIL 1. Just to point out, this is a SIL 1 with a risk reduction factor of 17. That risk reduction factor is that range. This is at the very bottom of SIL 1. Um, previously, we were at a risk reduction factor of 144. So for it to be a solid SIL 2 to drop, to barely a SIL 1 is a major difference. And the numbers that we chose were not unrealistic. Having 70% for final element, or 70% effectiveness for final elements is very, it's a normal occurrence, especially depending on how you're testing and if you're doing a partial valve stroke test, a full stroke test, um, those can really differ. And you had your um, sensors at a 90%, which is still pretty good. So as you can see, we dropping basically a base, a sill level and a half kind of. So how do you measure this proof test effectiveness? Well, one of the most accurate methods of predicting proof test effectiveness is to review all components of a product by failure mode and record or test if that happens will this or if that failure happens will this manual proof test detect that component failure um, Exeter does that through an FMEDA a failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis um, we take the cross sections of the devices along with a bill of material and go component by component and find every way that it may break in all of per component failure modes. Um, when we are doing that we can then look at whatever proof test is being done and saying this is the percent or this is the chance that any dangerous undetected failures would be detected with this manual proof test. So as I said before, your proof test effectiveness is going to be a percentage between 0 to 100, but is typically between 40 to 90 percent, and it's expressed in those dangerous undetected failures. And I want to stress it really needs to be understood that a manual proof test is the ton to done to detect failures that are not detected by automatic diagnostics. So if you have your automatic diagnostics testing the same thing as your um, proof test, it's not going to give you much information. It's going to just cost you time, it's going to cost you money, and really not accomplish much. What you want to do is have that manual proof test to detect the failures not found by those automatic diagnostics. As automatic diagnostics get better, your manual proof test coverage is going to go down. And it's backwards, but this is a good thing because the total detected dangerous failures or those detected by automatic diagnostics and manual proof tests increases and that will drop your PFD average. So like I said I learned best from examples what does this mean? So say you have two products that have the same um, 100 fits and dangerous failures and those fits are um, failures in time it's a unit of measurement in 10 to the negative 9 that failure rates are expressed in. If you have bought a certified product on the back of their certificate have failure rates and those are all expressed in FITS. So this dangerous failure rate you received from your certificate um, 
and uses the exact same proof test. Product one has poor automatic diagnostics. Um, it gives you a proof test coverage of 80%. And product two is using the exact same proof test, but it has good automatic diagnostics, and you're going to get a proof test coverage of 20. So is that saying that a product is safer or more reliable? Which product would you choose? Well, as I said, this is kind of backwards from what you would think. Um, same type of device, same failure rates, 100 fits. Exact same manual proof test, except product one has poor automatic diagnostics. So you, those automatic diagnostics are only going to find 10 fits. So it would be detected 10 of those dangerous fits, whereas 90, per, or 90 fits are still going to lay undetected. So that manual proof test is going to detect 72 of the remaining 90 fits, giving you a proof test coverage of 80%. So that leaves you 18 fits undetected, or 18 um, fail, uh, failure rate of 18 um, possibly dangerous scenarios that are not considered. Whereas product number two, same type of thing, exact same manual proof test, except this one, the automatic diagnostics are better. It detects 90% or 90 fits. And so your dangerous detected, instead of being 10 fits, is 90 fits, whereas your dangerous undetected is only 10. So this manual, same manual proof test, it detects two of the remaining 10 fits. So your proof test coverage is only 20%, but the, this one actually leaves you with only eight fits undetected, whereas the other one, proof test coverage of 80%, left you with 10 whole fits more undetected. So don't just look at the proof test coverage effectiveness or uh, manual proof test coverage and say, oh, this has to be a more reliable. It has a higher number. Actually, usually the opposite is true. Um, depending on what type of product it is, if it has automatic diagnostics, it's usually meaning the automatic diagnostics aren't as good. So we've been talking about um, proof tests and proof test effectiveness and the different types of proof tests. Well, we were able to really break down proof tests and say there's five main categories. Let's take an example, a ball valve. Say we're going to do a stroke test the ball valve. valve. You can stroke test it, you can time it, you could leak it, test it. So there's three major ways of testing or doing these proof tests. The first one, as you can see, you could do a partial valve stroke test, just moving the valve maybe 5 to 10 percent of its total stroke. Um, the next one, you could perform a proof test number two as a full stroke test, and this would be where the valve is opened or closed 100 percent of the total stroke. Um, the third option is to do that exact same, that full stroke test, but this time doing it at operating conditions. The fourth is doing that full stroke test, and this time doing a leak test as well. And then finally, you have your full stroke test at operating conditions with leak testing. To determine the effectiveness of each proof test or of any proof test, um, it can be done through a 
pretty simple process depending if you have the availability to do a FAMIDA or not. So the first thing to do is an establish a reasonable baseline failure rate for a device. Um, perform an FMEDA with the appropriate functional failure modes. Assign coverage as each function of the failure mode and test. Um, allocate between diagnostics and proof test. Um, but the first thing you really need to do is establish that baseline failure rates for each type of device. So to do that, you need to model the functional failure modes within a category of the devices, such as you have your ball valves, your gate valves, and order all of those together. Um, to try and be the most accurate as assigning these coverages, you want to collect data from a large population, we know that from stats, and have them in the same type of um, application. So you want to compare apples to apples. Then perform an FMEDA on a typical cross-section, as I kind of explained, um, and go through how you can break each fail, um, component and the failure modes for that and then assign coverage for each proof test that you want to look at. Whether you are doing all five types of proof tests, you can assign proof test coverage for each or just um, if you're only interested in let's say proof test three or proof test one, you can calculate the coverage there. Um, then finally you have to decipher between diagnostics and proof tests um, and where those failures are found. Um, and as I said, if you're already doing an FMEDA, this might be something you can easily add in. If it's not something you're familiar with, it might be a little more difficult. Um, for the example, I put together a SIF um, consisting of a solenoid valve, poppet valve, um, an actuator, and a valve, along with some assembly accessories, um, such as mounting and the coupling. And we did an FMEDA for each of these. And we came up with a total dangerous failure rate. Once again, these are in fits. So that's going to be the second column out to the left right here. So your dangerous failure rate of your solenoid being 432 fits, the poppet valve 60, the actuator 500, the valve 549, and the extras 50, giving you a total dangerous failure rate for your SIF as 1591. Then we examined each of these according to the different proof tests um, that we covered, being partial valve stroke test, um, full stroke test on and offline, and with leak um, testing. So as the proof tests get more complex, the um, amount of dangerous failure rates um, left undetected shrinks. So for your first proof test, you've discovered many more um, failures from zero, but there are still 679 dangerous undetected failures. Next, instead of just doing a partial valve stroke test, you do a full stroke test. This time you're only left with 400 fits dangerous undetected. You continue down to um, online or with the whatever um, process flowing through. So you're down to 330 fits. And then you add a leak test and you are at 86 fits of dangerous undetected left. And then finally, your most stringent proof test, um, you're only left with 16 fits undetected. 
Um, so when you compare that to the original 1591, you can see just doing a partial valve stroke test, um, it's great. You're finding over half of the failures, but don't do calculations saying that you're finding 100% of the failures when that's not the case. Um, we certainly understand doing proof test 5 is going to be in some applications not be possible. Um, in some applications it might be too expensive. Um, it might require a very costly shutdown. Um, there's all of these things that go into the different proof test levels. And if you cannot do one of the proof tests, absolutely, you don't need to. The standard doesn't say which level of proof testing you need to accomplish. But the standard does say you need to do your calculations with accurate numbers. So if you're only doing proof test one, you're going to have to do your calculations with your 57% effectiveness and not um, saying that you're finding all of your failures. So what we really want to come across on this webinar is to make sure if you're doing um, your probability of failure on demand calculations, um, make sure you're doing the calculations with the correct proof test coverage. This proof test coverage can impact the PFD average by an entire SIL level, and there's nothing worse than assuming that you have adequate safety when you really don't. Um, that proof test coverage can be measured in detail by looking at the product through an FMEDA, um, or you can use commercial SIF verification tools such as Excellentia that have those um, already have a database of proof test coverage already built in. Excellentia, any product certified in the Excellentia tool, especially through Exiva, is going to already consider your proof test coverage. So when you select device, it says we are um, demonstrating this proof test coverage. Is that what you want to use? You can always change that number in Excellentia. If you have reason to say, well, our safety culture isn't the greatest, we want to be more conservative, or um, we're doing a really great job, we are actually that site safety index for. Um, we can come down a little bit on this, but make sure that you have adequate justification for either way. Um, if I'm going to go ahead and take questions now. If you think of any later, please email me. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you want more information on this or different webinars or different topics, um, please feel free to go to our website. We have books, we have recorded webinars, we have our YouTube channel. Um, and if you think of any ideas for upcoming webinars that you'd like, make sure to send us um, an email or get us at, on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and this PowerPoint will be provided to you by the end of the week. You should have a PDF of these slides available to you along with the recorded on the um, website and the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.